Hello, everyone. Uh, with great pleasure, I am uh, introducing our speaker today, Dr. Peter McGraw. Peter is a behavioral scientist whose research examined how people's emotions affect their choices and how people's choices affect their emotions. His work has been covered by the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the BBC, NPR, Time, and Wired. Just recently, you've been in Oman, you've been in New Zealand, you've been in Australia. We had to reschedule at least once, Peter, and we understand why and appreciate your being here. As a professor of marketing and psychology at the University of Colorado, he teaches courses in marketing management and behavioral economics. He has spent nearly 10 years seeking the answer to the question, what makes things funny? He directs the Humor Research Lab, which goes by the acronym PEARL. As part of his efforts to crack the humor code, he has clowned with Patch Adams in the Amazon jungle, visited the Palestine to examine his first sketch comedy show, studied improv at the Upright Citizens Brigade, invented an algorithm to figure out the funniest city in America, created a comedy game show that pits comedians against scientists to see who has the best blend of brains and funny bone, and he has even tried his hand at stand-up at the world's largest comedy festival. You can read about his worldwide expedition exploring the comedy in his book, The Humor Code, A Global Search for What Makes Things Funny. He joins us to present serious business lessons from the masters of, com of comedy. Sorry, Peter, and welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you, Paul. Um, and, and thank you for all of your service. Um, uh, my mom had polio when she was a child and made, um, fortunately made a, a complete recovery. Um, and so it's, it's just great um, hearing what, what you folks do to help in that way. Um, so this, uh, um, this, is a, this is a new area, a new talk. I've actually, I told, I sold Paul, Paul on this idea by telling him it was a, my secret new project. Um, and it's not really a secret anymore, I guess, not with that camera there. Um, but, uh, but actually, let's just start. I have a question for the group, and I want you to raise your hand if you feel like you could use a vacation. Okay, except for that guy right there, all of you could use a vacation. So let's plan a vacation, okay? I'd like to, um, to do this. Let me turn this on. Um, we're going to plan a vacation, and here's how we're going to do it. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand up and, uh, and to turn to someone next to you, so, so create a pair, and, uh, and one of those two people will suggest a destination for your vacation. And the only rule is that you go back and forth, and you have to, use, you have to start each sentence with yes, but. And right, so I want you to plan this vacation back and forth, yes, but, add something to it, yes, but, add something to it, okay? On your feet, let's go. Okay, all right. So I know, I know you're excited about your vacation. So can I, I want you to stay on your seat, stay on your feet, please. Can I have your attention? So, so I'm sure you came up with a good vacation. We're gonna do this again. I'm gonna ask the other person to suggest a destination now with one change. And the change is this. I want you to start each sentence with yes and. Okay, so we'll do this again. The other person suggests a destination, but you start each sentence with yes and. Begin. <laughs>
Okay, everybody please have a seat. So let's have everybody take a seat. So um, I've done this exercise a number of times. First of all, you're free to do those vacations. I'd be happy if that happened. Um, I've, done, I've done this exercise a number of times, and one thing that, that regularly comes up is that there's a lot more excitement and enthusiasm about that second vacation. Um, and, and it is, um, and the act of building that vacation is, um, is really a foundational principle in, in improvisational comedy, which is actually called yes and, I call it agree and advance. Um, and what's interesting is, is yes anding things in life, um, as you just had a, a, um, a, a tiny part of it, it really helps build on ideas, um, which, is, which is, ends up being a really valuable part of, for instance, problem solving, creativity, innovation, and, and so on. Now, many of you may be familiar with that lesson. It's made its way into, um, into uh, the, the world of business, you know, improvisational comedy troops do, do improvisational training and so on. Um, but I was recently asked by the MBAs, the graduating MBAs at the Leeds School of Business to deliver a last lecture. And, and, in that, um, and when I was asked to do this last lecture, I wanted... I wanted it to be actually a valuable thing for them. And I started thinking about the kinds of talks that I could give. And I found that they, they weren't the kind of lessons that I wanted to give my MBAs as they head back into the real world. And, and so I, I just sat and thought about what I could do. And I had this realization that I could bring these three areas of my life together. This, this view of comedy that I've had for about 10 years now. Um, the teaching that I do in, in uh, marketing management and in behavioral economics, and then, and then the broad research that I do in those, in those two topics. Um, and, uh, and I realized that, that comedians, you know, these, these incredibly funny people, um, they may not be the people that you necessarily want to hire in your company, but they share the same traits as the kinds of people that you want to hire, the kind of people that you often want to be. That is that um, they're creative. They have good persuasion skills. You know, they, they think differently. And, and we're living in a world where thinking differently and having those kinds of skills are going to become increasingly important as robots come to take white collar jobs. Um, and so I, I started devising lessons based upon my observations of comedy and then, and then making sure that they work through the lens of, of a professor and, and, a, and a researcher. And I got a little carried away. I actually came up with 25 lessons. Um, I was told I only, had, I only had time for about four or five in the last lecture. Um, I'm going to give you a few of them. I'm going to give you a sample of some of those today, and, and hopefully they get you thinking uh, a little differently yourself. So... Um, one foundational idea in comedy is, is, uh, is called the reversal, right? So Ryan Reynolds uses the reversal in this a tweet about visiting Disneyland. Um, and this is really comedy 101. You know, you create some expectation and then you reverse it. You know, Henny Youngman said that, that when he read about the dangers of drinking, he stopped reading. You know, and so, so this is, this is a, you, and you find this time and time again, I'll, I'll show you, I'm going to show you a video um, of, uh, um, for those of you who may, may be old Saturday Night Live fans of um, Jack Handy, this is my favorite Jack Handy, it has a, has a reversal in it. I don't think we have volume. I can dictate it if need be. To me aren't funny. To me, clowns aren't kind of funny. Scary. In fact, they're kind of scary. I've wondered where, I've wondered where this started, and I think it, and goes, I think back it goes back to the time, to the time I went to the circus, and a clown killed, a clown killed my dad. <laughs> right, so, so you, you know, you can find this regularly when you, when you look at comedy. Now, what's interesting is that you can also find it in business. Now, it doesn't come naturally in business, but, but being able to produce an opposing perspective to be able to reverse your thinking is actually really useful. It can overcome a status quo bias. It can, op, uh, it can, um, it can present new opportunities. And it certainly creates situations that are, 
that are often unique. So I'll give you three examples of this right now. Um, the first one is um, two, uh, two entrepreneurs from Brooklyn um, wanted to create a, uh, create a new mobile phone. Well, you know, the question is, how do you out Apple and Samsung in terms who are creating smarter and smarter phones? These guys realized they couldn't do it. They reversed direction and they created what they call a dumb phone. Right, so the dumb phone only does text, sets an alarm, makes a phone call, does some basic navigation. It's designed for the person who doesn't want to be more connected, but rather wants to be less connected. Um, you may have passed this Warby Parker store on, on, on East Pearl. Warby Parker's putting eyeglass companies, brick and mortar eyeglass companies out of business by mailing people prescription glasses, and yet they're creating their own brick and mortar stores. They are actually reversing course in order to build their brand, serve new markets and so on. And in a time in the early, uh, early aughts, um, when, when fitness gurus were trying to make it to be never easier to get in shape, the creator of P90X got real and, and reverse course and said, if you want to get in shape, it's insanely difficult. It's never going to be easy. And this is a, this is a company that, that boosts just a 3% return rate. It has very happy customers because it, it, um, it, it found a niche. And now, you know, we live in Boulder. We see this everywhere, CrossFit, et cetera, et cetera. So, so having this, being able to produce an opposing perspective is a useful tool in business. Um, does anybody know this guy? This is Ricky Bobby. This is Will Ferrell playing Ricky Bobby in Talladega Nights. Talladega Nights is a very fun comedy movie about NASCAR. Well, Ricky Bobby has a saying. I teach my students this saying. Does anybody know this saying that he has? If you're not first, you're last. And, and the reason I teach them this saying is because it's really applicable to business, right? So when people are seeking a solution, whether that solution be a product or a service or an employee, they only choose one. And being second is the same as being 10th. And that's an important thing to understand when it comes to competing in a marketplace. Now, comics know this. Um, so this, this lesson I call create a chasm. Comics know that they can't make everyone happy. That is that they're very clear who their audience is. They're very clear about making those people laugh, and they're less concerned with making their non-audience laugh. They want to be number one, but they know they can't be number one for everyone. They have to be number one for their target market. So the lesson I talk about is there's a world of people who, who like hot tea, and there's a world of people who like iced tea. And if you try to make both of those groups of people happy, you serve them warm tea, and no one's happy. Right? And so, so comedians are really good about embracing Ricky Bobby's saying. So I, I use this example um, in class where I ask students which brand they want to manage. Um, and, I, and, and many of them who embrace this either hot tea or cold tea um, belief, they want to manage brand A, right? Because brand A has a group of people who love the brand. And there's a lot of benefits from having those delighted customers. They're less likely to variety seek. They engage in positive word of mouth. They're less price sensitive and so on. Now, of course, there's a whole bunch of people who hate this brand. That's fine. You're not going to make those people happy anyways. And so you can feel free to ignore them. And, and when you think about it, a lot of brands have that. You know, you ask people who love Starbucks, what do they love about Starbucks? Oh, I love Starbucks. I get, anywhere I go, I can get Starbucks. Everywhere I go, I get exactly the same cappuccino. I love it. You ask people who hate Starbucks. I hate Starbucks because wherever I go, there's a Starbucks. I hate Starbucks because everywhere, I, every time I go, I get exactly the same cappuccino. It's so boring, right? You know, oftentimes the same things that make someone love you also make them hate you. So you create a chasm. Um, the next lesson uh, came to me when I was working on the humor code. I had a conversation with a um, comedy screenwriter. He works in a pair. Um, and uh, we're on the phone, I'm talking to them, and he sort of offhandedly says, you know, Pete, do you want to know the secret to good comedy? And I was like, uh, yeah, that's why I'm calling you. And uh, he said, 
long, leisurely lunches. I said, go on. He says, my partner and I, we go to a cafe, we sit outside, we order some food, and we, we just sit and talk, and we, ha- we drink a good coffee, and, and the jokes start to flow. They start to come to us. You know, um, we, we enjoy ourselves. We enjoy our, our work. And, and when he said that, that immediately made sense to me. And it made sense to me because in the, in the world of, of, of research on positive emotions, one thing is very clear is that positive emotions are very beneficial in general to us, but they're especially beneficial for creative pursuits. That is, they help broaden our perspective. So what happens is when things are bad, when you're having a problem, we tend to narrow our focus on that negative thing. But when we're in a good mood, when we're enjoying a long leisurely lunch, we can open our perspective up. And that's beneficial to solving problems because solving a problem often ta- requires taking something from over here and something over here that don't immediately seem to go together and putting them together to solve that. So I'll give you an example of this. Um, this is called the candle problem. And so the candle problem is a way to, to measure um, people's creativity, their imagination. Um, and, and the way it works is this, they bring subjects into the hall, into, um, into, uh, excuse me, into the laboratory, and on the table there is a box of tacks, a candle, and a packet of matches, and these subjects are told that their task is to find a way to attach the candle to the wall, light the candle, so that wax does not drip on the floor, okay? So this is a moderately difficult creative task. About half the subjects in an experiment get it right and about half get it wrong, unless those subjects are in a good mood. Unless they've they've, they've watched some some, um, comedy videos and they come in there in a good mood. Then that number goes to 75%. Right? So there's a, there's a very clear benefit of this. Does anybody know how to solve the candle problem? Paul? <laughs> the key to the candle problem is to recognize that the box is there for more than just holding the tax. That it's instrumental in actually creating the solution. The participants empties the tax, takes some tax, and tax the box to the wall, light the candle with uh, the match, drip some wax onto the box, place the candle there, problem solved. If you struggled with that, I'm doing a bad job making you happy right now. (laughs) Two more quick lessons. Um, One of the things that I'm often envious of, of, of comedians is they, they seem to have that kind of leisurely life more generally. That is, they, um, they have free time. They create free time and space in their, in, their, um, in their schedules to be able to do their creative work. Um, so these are, two, these are two schedules I jotted down. They both contain the sum, same number of meetings, the same meals, the same um, uh, project work, but they're structured very, very differently. And one of them is structured in a way that, is, that, is pur- that, that seems purposely designed to hurt creative work, and one that is purposely designed to enhance creative work. And no matter who you are, there's, there's likely some element of your life that, that demands some creativity some time and space to solve problems. The problem is, is that, that working on it and then taking in a meeting and then working on it and taking in a meeting and having that kind of back and forth is not a good way to foster that, but rather create this comedic calendar which creates lots and lots of space and then lumps this, what we would call manager work. Meetings is manager work right? Um, this, is, this is maker work in this way. And I think that these, th- there's two problems to this. Is one is oftentimes managers create a schedule that's good for them, but not good for their makers, not good for their creative types. And then I think a lot of times people who are naturally creative people don't recognize that value. 
when you look back in history at deep thinkers, great scientists, inventors, musicians, etc. One of the things that you find is they're a lot like comics. They, they have many hours that they, they are detached from the world, then they wrap up their work, and then they become normal again, so to speak. Last one. Um, uh, this is from Bob Minkoff, a friend of mine who I met on the thing. It's, it's, if you can't read it in the back, it's a uh, gentleman's on the phone. He says, no, Thursday's out. How about never? Is never good for you? Um, I, have a really, um, I have a really obscene one of these that I showed the um, MBAs, and they loved it, but I thought I would I'd keep it PG-13 for Rotary. Um, so, um, um, so I call this lesson getting from, getting from yes to no. And, um, and what got me thinking about this lesson were my, my conversations with, with really accomplished comics with the kind of people who are creating television shows and, and writing screenplays and so on. And I, I think that there's an interesting, there's interesting times in life that no one ever tells you that it's good to change your behavior, right? So you, and you probably, when you reflect on it, are gonna be able to tell me what time of life you are, you're in right, right now. So my MBAs are in a time of life where they're on the offensive. They're, they're, gathering, they're gathering experience. They're saying yes to lots of things. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're building their connections and they're gaining skills. I, I like to say they're carrying a spear. You know, they're on the hunt. They're throwing spears all the time. What's, what's interesting is if they're successful in life, at some point, they're not going to want to be saying yes to all these opportunities. They're going to want to be saying no to most of those opportunities in order to say yes to a small number of things that are very, very important. And they're very, very important. So now they're going to have to exchange their spear for a shield that they're on the defensive. Now, what I think will happen is at some point they will retire. They'll put aside their their shield, and they'll pick up the spear again. So Paul and I were talking in the line about, I was like, what's retirement like? And he starts telling me all these things that he's saying yes to because he's gathering again all of this, this um, new opportunities and so on. And so I think it's important to recognize that getting to know at least one point in your career is going to be important. So Neil Brennan, who co-created Chappelle, so says to me, he's like, I don't want to work on your idea. I want to work on my idea. And so I think that that can be an, a useful thing. Okay, so, um, so what are the takeaways? So one is this value of, of yes anding, of agree and advancing in terms of building up and then making decisions. Our tendency is to criticize first, but we want to agree first and then criticize later. The value of reversals. That, that there's lots and lots of value to, to thinking in the opposite way. It won't always create a solution, but it can. Um, creating a chasm. Are you, do, does your customer want hot tea or do they want iced tea? But don't try to, to give them warm tea. You can't make everyone happy. And who doesn't want more leisurely lunches? Certainly, if you have problems to solve, it, it, it can be useful to be able to take the time and to enjoy your life to do that. Creating that space, that what I call creative schedule, or Paul Graham calls a maker schedule. And then lastly, should you be carrying a spear or should you be carrying a, a shield? Should you, are you on the offensive right now or are you the defensive to solve your time? Here's a glimpse at all 25 of, our, of the lessons. Um, and I want to say um, thank you and I'm happy to have, answer questions if we have, we have time here. Sure. Self. And um, humans are often called the storytelling animals. And I was wondering how much, what are the parallels between stand up comedy and storytelling? Okay. So, um, 
So I would say, so I so certainly agree, agree with you this notion um, that stories are, are unique to, to humans. Um, I, I, I've been highly recommending this book called Sapiens, um, in, which the, in which the author makes an argument. The thing that really makes us distinct from, from other animals is not language, actually. Other animals have language. It's actually our ability to believe in fictions. Right, which is, which is um, at the heart of, of storytelling. So I would say, um, I've never been asked that question, so thank you for asking me it. Um, I would say that the, the idea is this, is that um, the storytelling and stand-up comedy are, are, non, are, are slightly overlapping. You can imagine them as a Venn, a Venn diagram. So some stories are, um, are not comedic, some stories are, some stand-up comedy involves narrative, some stand-up comedy doesn't, right? And so, so traditionally, if you, um, if you were a stand-up comic in the 80s, your route to success, to television, to film, was to get on Johnny Carson. And one of the things that was very clear about Johnny Carson was they cared about laughs per minute. They wanted setups and punchlines and setups and punchlines. Um, but one of the things is, as, um, as uh, one is that, that um, medium as a way to, to become famous in comedy has diminished, is that it has allowed comics to, to take on different um, approaches to entertaining their audiences. Because really, I mean, when you, we go to see stand-up comedy, we want to be entertained. We want laughs. But, but that's only one form of entertainment. Telling stories is, is one um, change that I have seen over the years where um, an audience will give a comic time to set up a big punchline by creating a story in, in, that, um, in that way. So, so the way I see it is you don't need stories to be funny. You don't need um, to be funny to tell good stories. But when you can bring those things together, that can be a really, I think, special um, enjoyable and and I think when you when you look at a lot of stand-up comedy today you're starting to see um, more and more of that I have a question and okay. that is in your research how do you find that comedy or being funny impacts like the action you want the viewer to take so do you find that in using um, humor in marketing materials ultimately gives you you know more of the desired action. Okay, so um, I just um, co-authored a paper on, on this topic, um, and I can send it to Paul, who if people want, are suffering from insomnia and want, um, want to deal with it. So the answer to your question is, is, would take me, a, well, it took us about 30 pages to answer, but I can, um, what I will point out to you is I think a fundamental tension and puzzle when it comes to humor. It's actually part of the reason that I chose to take this lessons approach rather than to take a be funny approach. So for 10 years I've been studying humor and one of the things that I've noticed time and time again is that, that it's a double-edged sword. That oftentimes where there's great benefit, there's the potential for great costs. I'll give you one example in, um, when it comes to marketing communications. So one thing that's very clear is that consumers enjoy funny advertisements, funny marketing communications. They, they pay attention to them. They're less likely to, um, to, to switch away. They're, they're often better, um, better remembered than non-humorous marketing communications. They, they lead to things like, um, uh, they, they have the potential to lead to, to liking the brand and so on, but there, there's dangers in doing it. So one is, the memory effects only work when the humor is connected to the actual message that you want people to, to remember. If it isn't, if it's just tagged on funny, it actually can distract, it can have a, a, a reversal, um, a reverse effect. The other one is, is that oftentimes with the marketing communications, you want people to be moved to action, right? So if you want people to, to, um, to solve their problems, Humor is actually not often a good way to do it because humor actually helps us cope. And by making jokes about things, it actually may suggest that that thing's not that serious. So again, I have another paper that can put you to sleep that um, looks at humorous public service announcements. 
And one of the things that we find is, is that humorous, humorous public service announcements don't create the same action intentions as the traditional scary, upsetting public service announcements. And so, you know, we watch our late night TV, watch our Seth Meyers and our Samantha Bee and, and um, Stephen Colbert, that may make us feel better about the challenges in the world, but it, but it may not be the right form if you want people to go out and protest and to vote and to donate and, and so on. So one of the things that we find is very clearly can have mixed benefits benefits and costs and then as a result you have to be very clear about what it is you're trying to accomplish and then testing to see does it do what you want it to do any other questions okay one right here and maybe that's our last question and we'll uh, from there go it's to so our weird seeing myself up here. that which is funny in india is not funny in u.s and vice versa when you prepare to deliver a program do you do a lot of cultural uh, seeking to find what is funny for your audience? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so first of all, um, there is overlap, but it's not as great as we would like. So, um, uh, let me use this as a moment to talk about what makes things funny, because understanding what makes things funny can help answer that question. So. So the question of what makes things funny is an age old question. It goes back 2,500 years. People way smarter than me have been trying to crack the humor code. Aristotle, Plato, Thomas Hobbes, Immanuel Kant, Freud, et cetera. Um, the only reason why I think I was able to do it was one is my collaborator, Caleb Warren, who is a graduate student, is now an assistant professor, is way smarter than me. Um, the other one is that I can run experiments to actually test these ideas. I can go beyond philosophy. The thing that we, the, the theory that we find the most support for and, and serves as a foundation for the work that we do in Hurl um, suggests that humor arises from things that are wrong yet okay. Things that don't make sense yet make sense. Things that are threatening yet safe, or as we call them, benign violations. And so when you look at across all the things in the world that we tend to laugh at, they tend to have those two conditions. Now to your point, what is wrong and what is okay depends wholly on the audience member and what are their values, what are their beliefs, how many drinks they've had. You know, are they sitting in a comedy club, are they sitting in a church, or are they sitting in a classroom? And so, so both the context and the values of a person determines what is funny. And so that means that if you're going to be funny, or your hope is to be funny, you have to be really tuned in to who your audience is and to recognize um, that, that what might work with your American audience might not work with your, with your Indian audience. Um, so there are some universal things. Unfortunately, you really can't do them in a talk. So, so tickling is pretty universal. As long as the person doing the tickling is close with the person being tickled, right? Like, you know, um, so tickling doesn't actually create laughter when creepy guys in trench coats do it to you. <laughs> um, by extension, a lot of slapstick tends to be the most universal, real comedy. If you think about, you can watch Charlie Chaplin, you know, there's, there's almost no, no communication in that beyond verbal communication. Charlie plays on universal themes, you know, the bully, getting the girl, these kinds of things, and it's very, you know, him, Buster Keaton. Those, those films can still be funny today, they can be funny cross-culturally. Otherwise, it takes, some, it takes some work, and as a result, I often say to people, you should play it safe, or you should get some help from that, you know, from, from people in that culture in order to be able to, to be successful. Peter, thank you so much for this presentation. It's sure. been really fun and it's been very informative. We appreciate your time. Sure. Um, much like you, I have a parent who is also affected by polio, so I, I know a little bit about how that feels. But Rotary for the past 26 years has been working to help eradicate polio. And for a long time, we've gotten very close. We are even closer still. And so in your honor, we're gonna donate 100 doses of a polio vaccine uh, to help eradicate this disease in the very near future. Thank okay. you. That's fine.